So um, as George said, I'm one of the key GMESA developers. Uh, one of our other key developers is also uh, watching this. So um, if at any point I say anything wrong, uh, he'll jump in and chat and correct me. Um, and also, if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to ask them as we uh, go on. So um, oh, looks like my slide didn't. OK. Me. Yeah. So the first thing that I want to do before we uh, get into um, talking about, you know, streaming with GMA, so just I want to say real quick what uh, GMA is about. And it's a suite of tools that helps with streaming, persisting uh, data, doing data management and analysis uh, for spatial temporal data at scale. And I want to kind of click through real quick what we mean by some of those things. Whenever we talk about streaming, we use Kafka for a lot of what that happens there. Some of the analysis we've worked with technologies like Apache Storm and also City, and we're trying out KSQL DB a little bit in Kafka streams to do some of the analysis there. That's what this talk's mainly going to be about. Uh, we'll wind up talking about uh, persistence a little bit and data management uh, with NiFi a little bit. On the persistence side, this is where GMESA got started. Uh, the project got started back in uh, late 2020 uh, with writing data to Accumulo. And if you can write to one key value store like Accumulo, people will ask if you can do it for HBase. And Cassandra is pretty similar. Redis isn't that terribly different. At the same time, GMESA also uh, integrates with a number of file formats like Apache uh, Avro, Apache Arrow, Apache Orc, and Apache Parquet. If you use those file formats, you can use cloud storage like S3 or uh, Google Cloud Storage or Azure's blob storage options a lot more uh, directly. So a lot of options there for uh, saving data. When I talk about data management, I'm really talking about how to build up data pipelines. And that's where Apache NiFi has come into play a number of times uh, for us. And it's uh, what we'll talk about in the back half of this uh, chat. In terms of analysis, uh, GMESA integrates with Spark. Uh, there's also some MapReduce bindings here and there, but we mainly talk about what we do with Spark. That uh, a lot of what we heard uh, about Apache Sedona right before this, um, we don't we haven't focused on solving the problem the hard problems around spatial joins like they have, but a lot of the uh, post GIS functions uh, to help figure out what to query and how to slice and dice your data. Uh, GMAs has uh, had a long-standing integration with Spark for that. So if you were trying to put all of uh, that together, the thing that happens, uh, you know, kind of a proposed architecture that, you know, you might uh, apply to your set of problems would be if a data stream comes in on the left, we've got a number of tools that help us do ETL. Uh, we've got a converter library that helps us uh, transform data from whatever raw format it's in into simple features. Um, we uh, use heavily a library called GeoTools that uh, handles implementing the OGC standard of simple features. And so we need to turn XML, JSON, whatever binary file format someone's given us, we need to get that data into simple features. At that point, for the permanent persistence, we'll, along the bottom layer, we'll write data out to uh, places like Accumulo or, you know, write it out as Parquet files. And that lets us do things. Um, we can do batch analysis with MapReduce or with Spark in addition to serving the data out via GeoServer. For data that's evolving rapidly, we go ahead and send it along in Kafka. And that's a lot of what this talk's going to be about today. Uh, once the data is available in GeoServer, um, GeoServer speaks these OGC standards, and they're great. That means you can connect with um, any old OGC client. So you could be using QGIS. You could be using a number of uh, popular JavaScript uh, libraries like Leaflet and OpenLayers to connect. And there are even integrations with things like uh, you know, notebook environments like Jupyter, where uh, they'll help you load up a map with Folium, things like that. OK, so I, I want to make sure to be uh, fairly concrete about what we're talking about today. So I want to give a little demo of some of what we've um, built with these technologies. 
So um, one of the things that we uh, routinely process that we've talked about a lot on our blog is um, AIS data. It's a live view of where all the maritime vessels are in the world. So um, at the moment, I'm showing a map of the world, and every little uh, dot is some vessel somewhere. And Exact Earth is a company we partner with. They've got uh, satellite receivers that um, pick up, you know, the radio signals that are sent out uh, by these vessels uh, routinely as they're underway and as they're moving around doing things. So we can see where everything is, and we can just pick some place to uh, zoom in on. And the data that we're talking about here, once it comes off of the satellite, it gets to um, AWS. We process it with NiFi, and then we put it on a Kafka topic. And there's a geo server that this client is talking to that has all of this data in memory. And so we can pick on a particular uh, boat here and see more information about it, see that it's a sailing boat and the vessel name is Gulliver. Um, so someone wants to go and uh, live Gulliver, Gulliver's travels, I guess, at sea. Um, so there's something already powerful in just being able to see where everything is now. The place where we want to take things and where we want to go a little bit deeper with it is being able to run uh, analytics on um, what's happening. And to see a little bit of that, I'm going to click through. Uh, we've got a layer that we call activities. And what we can do is we can detect when vessels have um, left a port. So I clicked on one of these little purple circles, and it was telling me that, hey, whatever vessel here you know, has left uh, a port that it's nearby. And so we can kind of go back and forth uh, with things where I can write myself a quick little query, and I can find that particular uh, vessel. Just have to type in the MIMSI real quick. Um, and yeah, so our vessel here, the Scar Po, um, you know, uh, recently left a port. So I want to see where it's been for the last month, for the last 30 days. And I can make a quick query for that. And da, 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 da. let's zoom out and see where this guy has gone. So um, this is a completely live demo. Didn't know that I was going to get uh, a vessel that uh, you know traveled this far. It's really kind of nice that they actually went somewhere, because sometimes you'll find boats that just bump from one port to another. But over the last 30 days, we can see that uh, this boat has traveled through most of, I guess I would say, Northern Europe. Um, so in this quick little demo, I wanted to point out that we, in sort of the same set of interactions, went from looking at a live layer, and we'll talk about how Apache Kafka lets us work on that, to looking at an analytic where we were able to use uh, something like KSQL DB to create it. And we were able to go back and query HBase for historical data. And the data was managed and shuffled between whether it was going to Kafka or HBase by NiFi. So um, that's kind of the big points that I wanted to hit on in uh, a quick little demo here. So let me go ahead and uh, get back to present mode, and we'll chat through how GMESA and those technologies enabled what we're talking about. So this is just, like I said, the recap that I just went through verbally um, of what vessels we saw. And um, we didn't talk as much about the contextual data, but there were things where we could turn on a layer of uh, ports that was is basically a shape file. And um, base maps, uh, they get lost in the background. Uh, in demos. Uh, always good to know that you got those. OK, so the live data, like I said, came from the GMA Sakafka data stores, the activities. Um, we've used a few different technologies. We'll kind of touch on that at the end. And NiFi helps us um, move data around in the system. So let's dive into how we use Apache Kafka. So in case you're completely new to Apache Kafka, 
It is a distributed write ahead log. And the great thing about that is that walls allow for really fast writes. And it also helps you read pretty quickly because you can batch up all the messages that a consumer is behind on. The cool thing about it being distributed is if you've got a higher write or read load for a given uh, Kafka topic, you can partition it across multiple machines. And that gives you uh, more machines to handle the writing, more disks to handle reads and writes, and generally makes things faster. OK, so how do we actually get uh, moving dots on the map? And we had to get, uh, the producers had to get data from somewhere. And whenever that happens, they're going to write them out in a simple feature and write them to a Kafka topic. Since we're uh, drilling into the details, it's worth talking about what that format is. In GeoMesa, we have su we support two formats uh, for writing to Kafka topics. One of them is a custom cryo format that we've uh, worked up. One nice benefit of this is it gives us a way to unpack just the data we need in GeoServer. So some access patterns are a little faster with it. Um, the downside is, since it is uh, this bespoke uh, format for GeoMesa, it's not as interoperable with other folks. And so you do have the option to use Avro instead. Um, one of the downsides is that everyone is kind of doing geospatial in formats like Avro and Arrow and Parquet and Orc their own way. So um, you might have to think through that a little bit. Those cryo messages have a few flavors that they have. Um, one of them, most messages are saying that they're a creator update for an entity ID, that's, and that's how you know, whenever we get a new update for a particular vessel, we know that that's its new position. Um, sometimes, if we were talking about this maritime example, we might want something to disappear from the map, so we'd want a way to have a, uh, an ability to delete a given entity by ID, and so there's a delete message. Um, and there are also times when we want to be able to just wipe everything clean and there's a clear message. So that's a little bit about uh, how we implement what we do with message formats. So in terms of what lives in GeoServer or any other Kafka data store client, um, we need an in-memory uh, database that will uh, listen to the updates that are coming in on that Kafka topic and be able to answer spatial queries. So. That means we need a few things um, about this uh, database. So if we um, were thinking about uh, Powell's talk about Apache Sedona, yeah, we've got lots of spatial data structures. There are R trees, there are quad trees, and we've got a large volume of updates coming through. And some of them would be pretty uh, intensive to um, keep updated that way. And there are other in-memory existing databases that have spatial support, like H2. And I actually went and looked for it. Um, we, we tried that out back in 2016. Um, and uh, some of us wrote a quick paper about it. Uh, I, I had fun finding that the other day. And um, it, the H2 spatial support, we, we were able to rule something that, at least at that time, worked better. Um, so. Just to talk about that in-memory database for a few seconds, uh, we've got two things that we need to maintain. One of them is a lookup from feature ID to the given records that we have in the database. And if people were you know, asking where a given vessel is, this would be the, the way to answer it, because um, the feature ID in this case, the simple uh, features feature ID, is usually the entity ID. Um, and so if someone said, where's you know boat one, two, three, we could use this hash map and just get back the record and we're done. Uh, nothing else really hard to do. The spatial index that we have is actually just bucket index of grids. So we choose how uh, coarse or fine to split up the world. And every you know, cell just has a you know, bucket index that's not sorted any further of the records that are inside you know, um, that area. And it's pretty naive, but that also means it's pretty quick. So great thing about it is whenever we have an update, the hash map helps us find where the old record is for that hash map or for that new uh, feature ID. That means we can remove it quickly from the bucket index, and then we can go ahead and add back the new element. And so all of that winds up being 
pretty pretty efficient. So one of the things we haven't talked about is if you wanted to query on other attribute columns, um, maritime data, you can have information about whether the vessel is underway or um, whether it's anchored. There's also uh, how high or low it is in the water, a, a feature called the draft. And we have uh, a second option called CQ Engine. Uh, there's a really cool project called CQ Engine. Uh, check it up. Check it out on GitHub. And you've got the ability to turn on a CQ Engine index and say what attribute columns you're going to query by and what indices to maintain there. Uh, and so this is a link to the uh, paper that we wrote about that and where we found, hey, uh, this thing works pretty well. So um, yeah, just a quick little slide here. So this may be, yeah, anyhow. For spatial, we were doing well. Maybe for some of the attribute and spatial, H2 was doing OK. Anyhow, <coughs> one of the other things to say about GMASIS Kafka integration, it has some command line tools that help you manage um, some of the things that you would expect. So these kind of mirror the Kafka command line tools that help you manage uh, topics, send some sample messages, and listen to you know, what's being sent. <coughs> GMESA helps you do the same thing. For every simple, uh, for every uh, Kafka topic, we want to send data of one simple feature type. So we need to, you know, do this sort of um, create commands uh, for creating a new table, some more things to that. And the command line tools also help us convert data. Again, using that converter library I mentioned earlier, help us turn JSON into simple features or XML into simple features and actually send them to Kafka. We've also got a listen command that helps you listen to a topic and just see, okay, hey, here, here's the data that's coming through. And it prints it out in a human readable form. Okay, so next I wanna talk about Apache NiFi uh, for a few minutes. So let's drill into that. Um, so this is taken straight from uh, their front page, um, just where they're describing Apache NiFi. And the key thing that it's letting you do is have uh, directed graphs of data routing transformation and system mediation logic. OK, what does that mean? The really cool thing is this first bullet. It has a web-based UI where you can see everything that's going on. And you build up these data flows in this UI. And there are ways to, uh, you know, it's it's highly configurable. That's That's definitely true. And <laughs> you can also track data as it's going through the pipeline. One of the things that I really want to key in on is where it's designed for extension. This is where we've got a project called GMAs and IFI that adds in processors. And so, oh, a typo on my part. Uh, how do we use uh, NIFI? Typically, we use NIFI for managing data flows uh, and then doing uh, ETL. And so, Let's talk about this in a general setting first before we you know, make it more specific to geospatial. There are processors that will just read from an HTTP endpoint or listen to a TCP stream to get data in from a source. There are transform record and transform XML processors that will let you uh, modify the data that is in um, a flow file or work with the NIFI record API. And then you can write it out uh, back to a TCP stream or uh, write to S3 or write to a database to do your data load. OK, so let's talk through this with uh, symbol features in GMASA. So I wanted to kind of highlight a few of the processors we have. Um, this isn't all the components we have, but let's, let's chat for a second about these guys. So um, yeah, like I said, GMASA NiFi is one of the community projects um, that we have. Uh, also, there's GMS Geo Server. OK, so this first processor that I want to talk about is one where we can listen to a Kafka topic that's managed by GMESA, and it'll read in the um, read in the symbol features that are coming through there and write them out using the uh, NiFi record API. That record API lets you write the data out as, <coughs> as CSV or XML, JSON. Uh, a number of different formats. And so that's a really cool 
uh, powerful abstraction in NiFi. In terms of uh, transforming data, we've got a processor that will uh, convert data. Uh, GMS is integrated, like I said, with a number of file formats. One of them is Avro. We've got a processor that will use our converter library and take whatever um, you know formats it supports and turn it into GeoAvro. So that's um, an option. In terms of loading the data, we can go ahead and just the same way we've got command line tools that will help us do this, we can go ahead and take input data, apply a converter to it, and put it straight into G, uh, GMESA HBase with a processor uh, unimaginatively named put GMESA HBase. At the same time, if we've already turned the file into Avro, we've got one that it says Avro that we do uh, a put to GMESA HBase. For these backend uh, specific ones, like writing to HBase, we've got support for Cumulo, Cassandra, Redis, and our file system data store as well. So um, here I'm just showing the one processor because whatever we do for the one, we do for several other backends. So <coughs> we've also got a way to take in um, records and uh, do that. So we can map NiFi records into um, HBase and the other backends. And we also have the ability to update uh, records that are already in a database like HBase or Accumulo with the update GMESA um, HBase record um, NiFi processor. OK, so <clears throat> those processors, in addition to those, there are a few other things that are worth mentioning. One of them is we have configuration services that um, in NiFi, those will help you store all the ways, all, all the uh, connection data so that if you had 50 processors that were all trying to write to Accumulo, you don't have to enter the Accumulo configuration uh, 50 times. You can just say, OK, my Accumulo data store is configured with this configuration service. We mean all of these to use that same one. So that's really handy. <coughs> we also implement the um, NiFi record API. And this lets us write out. Uh, in any processor that writes out NiFi record sets, we can write GeoAvro files out of that. So uh, some of those things that I mentioned earlier that would let you transform records, they take uh, a record API reader in and take a record set writer out. And so that would let us turn uh, JSON that's in NiFi into GeoAvro. And as you do that, you have to make some choices about how things are mapped and so on. And all that's pretty straightforward to do. OK, so if we were putting this all together um, you know, into a sort of more geospatially enabled uh, case, and so this, this, this would go back to that uh, architecture diagram I showed at the beginning, we could read from a TCP source. Uh, the records we read off of uh, that uh, TCP, we could convert to GeoAvro. And one of the benefits of having uh, data in in that Avro format is that we could just save a copy off to S3, and that would let us inspect it later or load it into a database later in case there ever was uh, a major problem with uh, you know, an HBase that we were loading, or if someone said, I want to load it into a different database, we'd be able to just give them the source data. And those same files can be uh, loaded into HBase and Kafka with um, the appropriate uh, processors there. OK, so I want to hint at a little bit about streaming analytics. Uh, the thing that's um, uh, tough to share about these is, since this is a lot of uh, the custom work that CCRI does for uh, individual engagements, not as much of it's open source. And um, there hasn't been as much community sharing about doing really good spatial work on top of Storm or City or KSQL DB. Uh, for the longest time, uh, as soon as we had integration with Kafka, we've been working to use uh, Apache Storm. So we've, we've been doing that for years. Uh, that works really well. Um, some of the things to mention about uh, KSQL and uh, City is that they're both working to add streaming 
um, streaming statements to SQL. And so that means you have to work out what it would mean for something to be a stream and something to be a table. Or you have to define, as you're joining, uh, two different um, data sources. You have to two different data feeds. You have to figure out uh, what size window you're joining on. Uh, are you considering data from the last 10 minutes or last seven days? Um, so both of those have been really interesting projects to watch. Um, in particular, um, I, I owe Will LaForest uh, a shout out for uh, him saying wonderful things at the beginning of his uh, talk uh, last week at Kafka Summit. So uh, Will, whenever you're watching this on YouTube, thank you very much. Um, uh, Will has started uh, KSQL uh, Geo, where he's adding spatial uh, UDFs to KSQL DB. And he's got a demo of them uh, at the next uh, link there. So uh, I'm excited to uh, chat more with Will and uh, work through some of those details. Um, he's working out some of the very basic things uh, that you need to do. And uh, KSQL DB has some uh, current limitations with how, how some of the spatial joins need to be worked out. Uh, so um, there's definitely some more work to be done there. And so that was just a cool little thing I wanted to uh, call out. Um, and let me see. That is uh, actually what I've got for today. So um, all right. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. I, I probably, I've left uh, a little bit too much time for questions. So, uh, well, we'll see, right? Yeah. Oh, gosh, Terry Bedard had to leave, but uh, I bet he did have some good questions. Uh, I, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I don't see any there. So um, let's, let's maybe talk a little bit about your, um, you know, your bespoke GeoMesa lightweight database. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we built that back in 2016. Uh, mm -hmm based on yeah. what I had looked at a couple of different things. You know, things have moved on in that area separate from GeoMesa. I think of, you know, in some ways S3 and in some ways MobilityDB, kind of two different directions. Yeah. Uh, but is there, you know, things now? Or, or, are you going to keep growing that uh, uh, your lightweight database because it works? Or are you going to look towards um, plug and play with something else? Ooh. Um, yeah. I. I haven't had a chance. I, I really do need to check out Mo Mobility DB because um, they're uh, to plug another standard that I'm interested in. They're working on OGC moving features, I think. Yeah. Um, and did, what 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 did you mention other than Mobility DB? Well, in a different kind of a yeah, quite a different direction, I guess is S three. Yeah. Uh, you know, the discrete global grid. So bending stuff up and then doing right. it that way in a grid uh, with an index on a grid as opposed to you know coordinates. Yep. Oh, oh, so you said S3. You mean H3, right? H3. Yeah, OK, right, right. It was S2, yeah. H3. I always get the H3. <laughs> well, oh, so the Uber, okay. Uber DGGS that's now uh, folded right. up, folded, and uh, yeah. Fortware, I think, right? So sorry. Yeah, we, we, yeah. we, need to, we should separate. Um, I guess there are three things where uh, the numbers and names are all the same, because there's S2, which um, uh, engineers at Google realized that if you took the planet and put a cube around it, and then imagine you had a light source at the minute and just projected the planet, kind of like, boop, exploded it to the cube you just put it in, um, you could now have a pretty good little weird projection of the planet onto, you know, six flat uh, planes. In each one of those planes, you could grid up, and then you could play the space filling curve game uh, they use Tilbert curves because why not? Um, and that's that's S2. Uh, uh, so there's that library. S3 is is the uh, first uh, Apache Amazon service. I think it's their very first one uh, where they would hold your big file for you. Um, yeah. And there's H3. And H3 is um, Uber uh, wanted to come up with a way to grid up the planet. And they figured out um, if you 
if you tried really hard to cover the planet in hexagons, um, you would have to throw in just a few pentagons. And if you were opinionated about how you did that, you could put those over water where no one is uh, uh, hailing a car anyhow. Um, so um, yeah, I we've tried H3 a little bit internally. I haven't uh, been parts of those uh, investigations. Uh, one of the things that I do want to call out is that Geomesa's indexing is sufficiently pluggable that it would be relatively quick. And I've thought about it uh, kind of as a like hackathon kind of uh, event. It'd be relatively quick to add an H3 index. Um, H3, um, I don't know if it's going to, for an in-memory thing, I don't know how clever if it would be faster or not. Yeah, right, right. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely speaking out of my experience here. Um, what I'm looking for in memory is the, for the in-memory database that we're trying to use, I'm, I'm looking for the dumbest thing we could do. Um, and the, the like simple, stupidest, most quick thing we could do. And I, don't know how to be any dumber than what we're currently doing. We're, we're pretty smart to be this dumb and this simple. Uh, um, so yeah, um, I, the, the real thing that's killing us is the, the number of updates uh, that come through because um, you know there if, if you're doing this for the air domain at any point, there are 10,000 planes flying around. Uh, if you're doing it for maritime vessels, there are 200,000 vessels. Uh, moving around, and um, you know, uh, if you start to do analytics on those things, you not only have you, you stop caring about a little bit of data. Like whenever there are popular websites that'll let you uh, see where uh, a flight is or see where uh, a boat is. Whenever you do that, they have a little bit of data. If you start to do analytics, you start to fill out a lot more data about them. And so um, instead of just the 20 records or 20, not 20 records, the, the 20 columns, you might have hundreds of columns of different things you've inferred or decided that you know about the vessel. Um, and so even more stuff to keep track of in memory. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's much of an evolution since it's so small. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. shift the discussion a little bit, maybe. Um, yeah. We would defer to anybody that puts anything in chat, but um, mm -hmm. this point that you just made about, um, you know, lots of uh, points and lots of moving features, if we want to use that uh, phrase. Yeah. Well, the key, one, a, a very valuable um, query is of these two features, tell me where and when they were the closest they've ever been. In particular, mm -hmm. like with ships, how long did they stay close to each other in the middle of the ocean for an unattended, you know, questionable period? Uh, yeah. um, so have you addressed that kind of uh, query that looks at the the minimum distance over space and time? Ooh. Um, we've hit on questions like that. Um, the Yeah, because uh, from the moving feature uh, specification, uh, yeah, you're talking about the distance of closest approach is the the function I think you're you're talking about, and it's it's really easy to you know because uh, everything with GeoMesa the the killer reason to use GeoMesa is to manage uh, IoT data coming off of things moving through space and time. So at that point, it's really easy to say I have two entities, and so instead of saying I've got two trajectories, you can say I've got two entities. I'm, I'm looking at two planes or two boats or a boat and a plane. When were they close together? Um, and so it's really easy to uh, set up the question. Uh, yeah, um, we haven't figured out, uh, um, you know, what is it, distance of closest approach. Um, but it would be one of those things that if you were going to write down, that, that, that would be a pretty quick analytic to write down because you would just get the histories of both vessels. In something like HBase, we index by uh, entity. And so those calls would come back in a second or two, and then you would just have to replay through history and, you know, do the obvious thing where you say, okay, you know, at midnight, how far apart were they? At 1 a.m., how far apart? 
Yeah. And um, in terms of other options, uh, one of the things that uh, you ask in terms of moving features is, um, um, you know, if if you were if you didn't have moving features and you looked at somebody's track, two dimensional track, and you said, "Find me all the data that's around some track," and you just did a buffer, and now you changed the time window, you would have um, you you would just have a Cartesian product times that, and you would say, "Oh, what were all the vessels, or like what were what were all the cars that were drove near my car any time, you know, in the last year," and you know. They, there, there would be cars that are nowhere near me because if I went home and drove for ten hours on I eighty one, you know, whatever. Like most of the cars that drove on I eighty one were nowhere near me in terms of time, and so uh, we've got something called, um, and its name just escaped me. Uh, we've got something that helps uh, buffer around time so that you get instead of the Cartesian product with time, uh, you get the right sort of thing there. Um, oh, yes. Uh, yep. Martin's got a good question here or a good comment here. Yeah. Um, that, yep. Uh, moving features, yep. So, moving features is to find that query that we've just spoken about. Mm -hmm. and there's a, you know, an implementation spec for it. Uh, the key thing is implementations behind that to achieve those queries at scale on large moving databases is, uh, you know, where you guys are uh, really pushing the envelope. So. Yeah, and um, the 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 arc that I've seen in a few places. Um, I'm going to mention it this way because, um, you know. Uh, most of the time, whenever people come to a, a database system like PostGIS, they get really excited about like R trees, and they're like, "Oh, it's cool! PostGIS has a, like this R tree, and that's how all your queries are going to be fast." Um, but the we, when we've integrated uh, when we integrated GMESA with Spark, one of the things that I realized is that the path through history is the first thing you have to do is you have to actually figure out what the dang data types are. Um, and if the system needs to be taught about those types, you've got to do that first. So, um, you know, the first step in PostGIS isn't write the R tree, it's create points, lines, and polygons. And same way within Spark, you have to do that. And the next step is to actually write down the functions. Um, and so that's just a separate thing where you have to know that, like, what, what's the semantics of two polygons intersecting or, you know, asking when a point is inside a polygon, or how do you buffer a point? Once you've written down those functions, now you can actually express yourself, write queries, and do things. And it's only once you've done that, that that third tier, that third step is where you actually do the optimizations. So uh, that's where it's been really cool to see um, <clears throat> the moving uh, feature specification since it defines uh, what we mean by, um, you know, uh, I can't remember if it calls them trajectories or not, but what we mean by a trajectory and then the functions on them, because then you, we're, we're at least clear about what we would be building a data structure to do. Yeah, yeah um, I get those semantics, right? Yeah. Well, we've got one minute left. Let me ask you a real quick question. You mentioned GeoAvro a couple of times. Yes. Where can I find GeoAvro? Uh, GeoAvro is all around you. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, you can find out more uh, at gmesa.org. The thing that we've done is with all of these data types we integrate with, since, since the fundamental um, projects aren't picking up these standards the way that we are and implementing them, uh, like what Martin does in SIS or what other folks have done in Jenna and so on, um, like there, there's, there's no standard way of saying what a par uh, parquet file that should have um, geospatial should be, or what it is for Avro. So we've went ahead and said, "Hey, here's our way of putting simple features in there." Um, you know, uh, your mileage will vary because it's just we've made decisions about how to use those file formats. Um, yeah. Cool. But yeah, uh, that's where we're definitely in the situation where it's an implementation. Uh, getting out ahead of uh, community agreement and standards, but you know we've had need to, you know, get things done with them. So, uh, yeah. And as I mentioned in other talks, uh, we're active on Gitter. 
Uh, so you can reach out to us there or our mailing list. Um, so yeah, uh, good questions.